Okay, real quick. Uh, we don't have much time in here, but that's all right. I'm just going to do just a couple little things here. Well, where do we start now? We can start now, right? Okay, so uh, what was the graph of the uh, of the natural log function? Do you remember what the graph looked like? Okay, so it's where's it where's it start? Remember now it's the area under an inverse function, right? So for start, you know, the area from one to x under an inverse function. And so if we do that, here I'll just draw this little graph up here for a second. So we know this is what it measures. It measures the area from one to x, right? That was how we defined the natural log. That area is the natural log. So at 1, at x equals 1, the area must be 0, right? So across the x-axis at 1, what did it look like? What's the shape of a log function? Yeah. So yeah, I've seen the... Does something like that. Remember that? And that's, it doesn't probably, that's, let me preview that a little bit. That's a little too high. I'm being picky about this for a reason. I see why. More, I mean, sort of like that. You get the idea, right? It's, it's it's just flattens out with time forever. You know, the further you go to the right, the flatter it gets. But it always rises. That's a very very slow growing function. Okay, now let me ask you this: If you think back to to you know, we've been uh, pre-calculus and Algebra 2, you would have talked about this a little bit. We haven't reviewed this much this year, but do you remember what the criteria are for whether a function has an inverse? Um, yeah. 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 I can't remember how much we've said about that in here. Not, not probably a whole lot. Oh, yeah. You have to flip it. You have to rotate and flip Okay, I told you guys the trick about rotating and flipping, right? Okay. So counterclockwise. Yeah, right. counterclockwise, good. Okay, and so then so then if we were to do that, right, if we were and really what that amounts to is reflecting it over the line y equals x. That's the line of reflection for inverses, right? So here's our line of symmetry. And if we just reflect this over that line, don't we get something? Kind of like this. Oh, sir. Like that? Yeah. Okay. If I, you know, and you can kind of see that in your mind if you sort of play this cartoon where you where you rotate this thing about 90 degrees, it ends up sort of right here-ish, doesn't it? If I rotate this thing 90 degrees. Get something like that, and then if I flip it over the y-axis, I end up with this guy, right? Okay. So, uh, are those both functions? Yeah. They are, because they both pass the vertical line test, right? So, just a quick reminder: what's what's the criteria then? We we can see that the the log function, you know, it's a function, right? It passes the vertical line test. How could we have predicted before we ever actually drew the inverse that the inverse was going to be a function? Okay, so it passes the horizontal line test, right? Good. It passes the horizontal line test. The horizontal line is what's when when reflected over the line of symmetry it becomes a vertical line, right? Okay, so the horizontal line test for the green function translates into the vertical line test for the red function. Good. Uh, the, the word that we use to describe a function that has an inverse everywhere is one to one. One to one meaning, and the, and the reason we say that is because for every x value, there is only one y value, and vice versa, right? 
meaning that it, it essentially what that means is it passes both the horizontal line test and the vertical line test. For example, this is a, there's a function <coughs> that is not one to one. For every x value, there's only one y value, yeah. but for every y value, there there is not necessarily just one x value. Does that make sense? Yeah. For example, that horizontal line has those two intersections. So for that particular y value, there are actually two x values, right? So one to one means it maps both ways. For every x, there's one y and vice versa. Yeah. Okay. So any function that's one to one is guaranteed to have an inverse. All right, so why do I bring this up? All right, so the, the inverse of a log function is also an interesting function. Okay, that's something we want to explore. Log function, hugely important. We haven't really got into the applications. And that's really all I want to do this year. I just want to get to a point where you guys can, you know, we, we, can, we can start to look at, at, at a problem in calculus, like a mathematical model where we understand the calculus. Like we could look at radioactive decay or something like that, you know, and say, okay, here's why, here's why it works, and here's how the calculus supports your understanding of that. Just to sort of model that what calculus will do for you with other functions in the future, just to give one good example of, of how that works. Okay, so let, let's explore this, this inverse of the natural log function. So we know some things, but we know properties of natural logs, and we talked about those the other day. If we take the function y equals log x, we know that if we take a log of a product, it becomes a sum, et cetera, et cetera. But there was something else we talked about. We said that whenever you write a, a log function, you can write that in a, in a parallel way. You can write that as an exponential function also, right? There's an implied base here. There's a base e. If you remember this from last year, we don't have to relegate ourselves to just talking about base e stuff. We can talk about any base, uh, but in this case, we're talking about base e. More generally, we could say this, y equals base a log of x, let's say. Okay. Do you remember how to write that as, as an exponential statement instead? There's a corresponding exponential statement. Remember what that is? A to the y, y equals x. Say it again. A to, a to the y. Okay, good. A to the y equals x. Good. So a log is an exponent. Right. So whatever the log function is, that's equal to the exponent of the exponential function. Right. So we write that as. The base of the log becomes the base of the exponential. Looks like that. Or for us, in the case of, of base e, even though we don't write that e when we write a natural log function, it's still there, right? That's the implied base as, as, the, as the natural number e. So we end up with x equals e to the y. So these two things say the very same thing in just different ways, agree? So then now, what's our recipe, if you think back to prior years, what's our recipe for finding the inverse of a function? What did we always do? For example, if we wanted to find the inverse of, let's just say we want to do the inverse of y equals 3x cubed minus 1, what would we do? What it means to be an inverse relation? What does it mean? Think what we did here. Now think about this. We, we've got this function and its inverse function, and we've got the symmetry about the line y equals x. Well, let's let's take a pair of points that are reflected onto each other. Let's take this point right here, which reflects onto that point right there. Let's say the coordinates of this point right here are, uh, let's just call them A, B. Okay. The x coordinate is A, the y coordinate is B. What are the coordinates of the point on the inverse function? Everybody see that? Doesn't that make sense? Instead of going over A and up B, if we want to get to this point, which has symmetry about this line, we're going to go over B and up A, right? Right? So. So all we really did here was we just interchanged the domain and the range, and that's all we do, right? 
So with inverses, that's the recipe. Is we just we just swap the x's and the y's, swap the domains and the ranges. So in this example here, we would just switch x, switch x and y, and do what? Solve for y. Yeah. And if I solve for the new y, that's the that that's going to be the the inverse of the original, right? So in this case, we just add one, divide by three, cube root, right? And we end up with y equals what? X plus one over three to the one third. Okay. So we can do that same thing then for a log function. But instead of using the log function, which we're not really sure how to deal with at this point, let's use the exponential function. How about, right? What I mean by that is if I, if I switch the x's and the y's on this side, it doesn't seem to help us very much, does it? I end up with x equals the base e log of y. But to this point, we're not really sure how to isolate that y. Make sense? So that's not very helpful. But this is. If I switch the x's and the y's here, what do I get? y equals x. y and equals x. Yeah, so that's our inverse function. How about that? Right? This is the inverse function of that. AC exponential. Okay. And if we go back and look at these graphs, there's the graph of an exponential function. And you're, you guys are familiar with this. I mean, it's, you probably we haven't used this this year, but you would have used that a lot last year, I'm guessing. So you can see the hallmarks of this is it starts with slow growth, and the growth gets very rapid, and hence the expression, it's increasing exponentially. Everybody says that, and that's why, because it grows so fast. If something's really increasing rapidly, we tend to say it grows exponentially, even if it doesn't. Uh, okay, so then let's just talk a little bit about what the, we could actually go through a little derivation and come up with this calculus in a tricky way, but I'm, I'm going to resist the considerable temptation to do that. Just because I want to get on with you guys actually using it a little bit. Uh, this is the definitely the easiest, the easiest function to deal with in calculus is the exponential function. Uh, it's what, well, we suppose the derivative of an exponential function is a log. What would be the easiest outcome possible? No. Um, easiest outcome would be if it didn't change, probably, right? Oh, yeah. Well, it doesn't. That's it. How about that? <clears throat> the derivative of an exponential function is just the exponential function. Okay. Now, if, if we apply that, if we add the chain rule to it, we just get this. The derivative with respect to x of e to the u by the chain rule would just be, oh, why do I don't need to see? What am I doing with c? There's no c. We're doing derivative. So there's no c. Uh, it would just be e to the u what? times u prime. Okay, so let's try a couple examples. What if we have something like uh, y equals e to the 2x minus 1? What's y prime there? Yeah, so there's just the derivative of e to the hand is e to the hand. But then continuing with the chain rule, times the derivative of hand would be 2. That's it. Okay, okay what's the, what's the derivative with respect to x of e to the minus 3 over x? What do you think? What's our recipe here? What's u? That, right? So the outer layer is just an exponential. So the derivative of e to the u is e to the u. So the first layer is just e to the minus 3 over x times the derivative of u. So what's that now? We've got to be a little careful with that one. Oh, okay, good. So we think of that as being negative 3x to the negative 1. Good. 
And so if we differentiate negative 3 x to the negative 1, this would be negative 3 x to the negative 2. Yeah. So right. You know, we bring the negative down. Good. So we get 3. Excellent. So 3 x to the negative 2, right? So it's negative 3 to the minus. Yeah. So we could combine all that stuff and just write it as what? Uh, <laughs> 3 e to the minus 3x over x squared. And technically, what's e to the minus? Where would I put a minus 3x? What, what's the negative do? Yeah, it pushes it to the bottom also. So I could even write it like this. 3 over x squared e to the positive 3x. Okay, good. All right, so the integral is not much harder. Integral just looks like the, well, why don't you tell me? If this is, this is good practice. If the derivative of e to the u equals e to the u the u dx. Okay, how do we come up with the integral formula? This is something I'd really like you to remember how to do. What do we do with that? Remember that there aren't, aren't going to be any x's, are there? Right? Our integral standard form shouldn't have any x's in it. It's just going to be u. What's the first step? Okay. Yeah, we, we want to put the derivative in differential form. We're going to multiply both sides by dx, right? Yeah. Algebraically, we'd say that. So if I do that, the dx is cancel, and I just end up with, in differential form, we just get the derivative of e to the u equals e to the u the u. And then I just integrate both sides, right? Take the antiderivative of both sides. And so the, the antiderivative and the derivative cancel, right? And we end up with this <coughs> equals that to within a constant, right? Oh, uh, whoops. That's it. Okay, that's our integral. Corresponding integral. So let's try one of those. How about let's look here? How about this? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, We'll get a little extra practice if you use substitution. So now on everything, I'll use substitution. That's the only thing I really read. I mean, you, just, you don't ever really do basics. Very, very seldom that you don't have to do something more than just a just a basic integral. You usually have to do some something. At least at least you use substitution. If not, something we'll learn next year. So what would be our u substitution here? Yeah. Does that make sense? We want to pick the inside of a function if possible. So here's the inside of the exponential function, right? So that's a good choice for you. Right? So what's du? Negative 2x. Negative 2x dx. So that's what we have, right? Divide by negative 2. Yeah. So divide by negative 2. And so what we have right there is negative one half du. We can make our substitution integral e to the u times negative one half du, right? Okay. Negative one half times, and look, that's an easy one. We just get back e to the u plus c. Reverse the substitution, we're there. 
negative one half e to our negative x squared plus c. What's that? Okay, give you a little harder one. Try transitives. choice here for you has got to be that 1 over x. It's got to be what's inside the exponential function. Because right? would you agree you're never going to get back? Like if I chose something else for you, how am I going to get back an e yeah. to the 1 over x is my du, right? That's not the answer to any derivative except e to the u, right? Yeah. So this has to be our u. Yeah. And plus you want to bring up x squared to yeah. half of x negative one. Uh -huh. So if u is is 1 over x, same as x to the minus 1, right? Yes, it's negative. Negative x squared. Right? Same thing as negative dx over x squared. Right? <coughs> so what we've got, it looks like, is just that. We have a negative du. Right there. So we just get integral e to the u times negative du. Right? No biggie. Just plug it. Plug it. Oops. Should be red. Now we reverse the substitution. I think there's really, that's it, that's it. <clears throat> Any questions on anything we want to go through, trapezoidal rule, anything like that? While we're here, we got a few minutes, not much. Any questions? Good.